Yeah, um, that's me, my sister out there. I'm the youngest of three kids. I'm the youngest one in the family. So my older brother, a middle sister, and then it's me, the youngest one. You know how most of us, the youngest ones, we are the black sheep of every family, right? Except, except some of you, but... Um, my mom always tells the story how she was blessed to have my brother, then she was um, graced to have my sister, and then she had me. <laughs> she always says how she remembers the exact moment where she was diagnosed with me. <laughs> my father and my mom, they always tell the three of us that they wanted to have two children. And then they decided to have another one because she was pregnant. <laughs> Joking. This is me. Look, I had big ears. They used to call me Dumbo. You know Dumbo? The elephant of us. No, really, they used to call me Dumbo because of the big ears. I had big ears. Uh, now my ears are normal, but I, I also had a big forehead. Look at my forehead. I remember one time in kindergarten, this, in kindergarten, this kid comes to me and says, Hey, you don't have a forehead, you have a five head. <laughs> <laughs> this is my grandpa and my grandma. I'm the one in the middle, look at that hair. I'm the one in the middle with the hair. Looks like half a monkey and half a horse. <laughs> That's the one in the middle, that is me. My grandpa and my grandma, they come from Ukraine. They came to Argentina, they met, obviously from different families, they met there when they were in their late uh, teenage years. They fell in love, they had their family and so on. My grandpa was 10 years older than my grandma. And my grandpa was always a man of only a few words. He wouldn't really speak much. His Spanish was not so good. So um, he was the, the number one family member that would not be of many, many words. So th there was this Christmas reunion, this uh, was in the, uh, the 24th of December in the night, where uh, he got emotional, my grandpa, as if he would have known that it was, this is a, a, a story, that it's a true story that I want to share with you because this is, sometimes we realize how the world perceives us, right? And that was the moment that I realized how the world perceives me. Because my grandpa got emotional and started talking and talking and talking in the, in the Christmas reunion mm -hmm. as if he would have known that it ended up being his very last Christmas with the family. Mm -hmm. And he got emotional and started talking, talking, talking. And then he started saying things about every family member. And he left the three kids, the three kids, brother, sister, and me, for the very end. So he said some very nice things about every family member. It was like 12, 14 of us. And then the three kids, so he goes, Augusto, my brother. Muy inteligente, very intelligent. Eleonora, my sister. Muy inteligente, very intelligent. And then everybody was waiting to see what he would say about me. And he said, Alejandro, buen chico, good kid. <laughs> I said, I really wasn't going to be so smart as my brother and my sister. So I decided to just be fun. <laughs> but it's a true story, and it really, uh, my brother and sister, they still make fun of me. That's the whole family. Okay, um, these are two pictures I cannot show back home, because uh, one is the, with the Brazilian football t-shirt, you know, football soccer. And you know, Brazilians, they are our enemies in football. And the other one is with the England shirt. And you know how England, they are our enemies, period. Uh, so yeah, two pictures that I hope you don't, you don't show to anybody. This is a just fan of the Rolling Stones, you know, the Argentinian band, the Rolling Stones, look at that hair. <laughs> family, I was a black sheep in my family, you know, every, oh, you know how you call a sheep with no legs? A clown. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a something I'm very uh, keen on, I'm very fan of. There's this Brazilian author, very famous in South American countries, who talks about the universe being on your side. That if you are brave, if you have a great heart and you go for your dreams, that most of the obstacles, before you go for your dreams, they look like, oh, too many obstacles, I don't think I'm gonna make it. But if you are brave and you go for it, you push away some obstacles, and then when you're halfway there, the other obstacles will be just gone, and that is the universe helping you. I'm a big fan of that. And this, I also like this image. Sometimes what's holding you back is only in your head. <laughs> um, I like this movie. Have you seen this movie? Yeah. 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 It's a society where Robin Williams talks about this professor who is in, in a very strict school and they, everyone is, very, is being very strict with their students. And this professor talks about carpe diem, enjoy life, seize the day, 
and so on. And I, and I really find him um, very inspiring. This movie was released in 1986, more or less, and that's when I was growing up. It may show my age, although I wasn't honest just now. I was born in 2000. <laughs> it's another movie that I like a lot, very forward. It, looks, it talks about this one kid who thinks he can change the world by doing favor to people that he doesn't even know, three people. And then those three people to make favors to three other strangers that you don't even know, and that's how we can change the world. It's a very nice movie. This is me, 2000, 2002, as soon as I graduated in tourism and hotel management. It's a four-year degree. My brother and my sister, they studied something very difficult. I remember seeing them suffer while they were studying. And I remember thinking, if these two are smart, and they're suffering while studying something difficult, I can only imagine me. So I decided to just study tourism and hotel management because I knew it was going to be easy. And so I went to Brazil. I took a two-day bus out of nowhere without knowing anybody, not even a phone number, nothing. I just said to my family, hey, I'm going to try my luck. I'm going to go to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, on my own. And I started looking for a job, and I actually found a job in a hotel, in two different hotels, in Bucios. Bucios is a place that is close to Rio de Janeiro. Has anyone been there? Yeah! Bucios? Yeah! Wow, because it's not very famous in South America, oh. it is, but not really in, in the US. Where are you guys from? Portugal. Ah? Ah, Portugal. 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 Okay, so you've been to Brazil. Yes. Yeah. That's a big, very beautiful place. So I worked as a receptionist. I loved my experience there. I worked there for uh, many months, almost a year. I loved it. And I said to my, oh, the, the, it was a great working experience. But you want to know what my salary was? It was six bananas per month. <laughs> <laughs> the experience was so much fun. And obviously being away from your country, learning a new language, like Portuguese, they speak Portuguese in Brazil because they were colonized by the Portuguese, which explains why they're not very good in football, the Brazilians, because they were colonized by the Portuguese. Who are the <laughs> 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 then I said to myself, oh, this was so much fun going to Brazil. Now I'm going to go to Mexico. My next dream was to go to Mexico. I went to Cancun. Has anyone been to Cancun? Yeah. And I decided to, I wanted to work in Cancun. I didn't even know anybody, not even a phone number, nothing. Out of nowhere, I went to Cancun. Mexico started looking for a job. It cost me two weeks because it wasn't so easy. Because in Mexico, in uh, Cancun, all these all-inclusive beach resorts, they have a um, security gate at the entrance. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, it was different. Bucio is such a small place where you can actually enter in the hotels and then talk to the people that are there in the hotel. But in Mexico, it was difficult because I, I wasn't even allowed to get in because in the security checkpoint, they would tell me, hey, what are you here for? Oh, I'm looking for a job. No, we're not looking for anybody. So I couldn't even get in. So it took two weeks. In those two weeks, I cried three times, thinking, oh, what am I, what am I doing? What am I, I didn't want to come back home without uh, the job that I wanted to get. So, but hey, the universe helped me, and I ended up working at the Rio chain. Does anybody know the Rio chain yes. of hotels? It's yes. a Spanish chain. They're very well known. The service is great. It's an all-inclusive beach resort. It's called the Rio Cancun. That's where I found a job, and it was so much fun. And I remember this angel, uh, guarding angel, because I was looking for a job at, at reception, at the front desk reception. I had my binder with my residence, and this guardian of angels comes to me out of nowhere. He recognizes that I was South American, like he, he was from Europe. I said, hey, you're looking for a job? I said, yes. What are you looking for? Well, I'm going to go to the front desk. And he said, why? Why don't you come to activities? And I was like, activities? What is that? He explained, well, you play volleyball, <laughs> uh, water polo, beach soccer, <coughs> the beach soccer, and so on. And then in the night, you go to the nightclub. And then and I was like, hey, do we even get paid? And he said, like, yes. <laughs> so I said, OK, you don't have to sell me more. Ten minutes later, I was talking to the general manager of that hotel. And they said to me, OK, there's a space for you in entertainment, but only one space available. Uh, you have to work with kids doing activities with the kids. And he asked me, do you have any experience working with kids? To which I replied, no, but I am a kid myself. I'm sure I can do pretty well. <laughs> and so I was in charge of doing activities with the teens and kids. And my only job was that the parents don't see the kids for a whole week. And I was very good at it. <laughs> oh, so yeah, that's it. Uh... <laughs> And we were doing just very much promoted to adults uh, activities like we were doing uh, water sports, uh, land sports, which is so much fun. Michael Hutchins? No, what's his name? Whatever, that guy. Me, I look better. So, yeah, it was so much fun. Look at the kind of activities we were doing in Mexico. 
I'll give you an example. This is the address of his house. That's me with a tuxedo in 50 centigrade uh, degrees, which is Fahrenheit like a thousand. By the way, it's with a tuxedo, and we had the race of the stars. This is Spider Man, Superman, Barney, even Michael Jackson was there. It was so much fun. I'll give you another example of how much fun the activities were in Mexico, in Cancun. Uh, one of those was tequila volleyball. So we would go, the host, which in this case would be me, with a whistle in the middle of the water while there are two teams playing tequila volleyball in the pool. Pool volleyball. So with a whistle and whoever messes up a bottle of tequila and a hole in the cup. So whoever messes up, uh, the teammates splash the person. That gives me time to get there in the water and get closer to the person that messed up and ask their teammates, hey, how many seconds? According to bad, how bad the mess up was, 20 seconds. Head down, open your mouth, tequila. <laughs> it was so much fun, but you can really imagine the games were not really uh, completed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, I asked, when I came to Celebrity, I said to my managers, hey, can we do tequila volleyball? They said, maybe not a good idea. <laughs> but it was so much fun. You wanna know what my salary was then? One Mexican sombrero per month. <laughs> the salary wasn't good either, but my experience was just invaluable. That's when I discovered the entertainment world at the front, and I realized I was going to be so good at it, or I thought I was. No, my next dream was to go to the United States, because I really wanted to work in the United States. So, different from what I did in Brazil and in Mexico, when I, on my own, I just went to those countries, stepped in there, and started looking for a job in the U.S., I couldn't do it because, as you know, no one can enter the United States without a visa. <laughs> I thought that was the case. <laughs> so I applied for the American visa when I was in Mexico, working in Cancun. I went to the Merida Consulate of the United States, which is a three-hour city away from Cancun in Mexico. I wanted to do the right thing, by the way. I would never be illegal. I wanted to do the right thing. So I go to Merida Consulate in the United States. No, because it's not the universe which will help you. I believe that the Internet will, so the universe helps you achieving your dreams, you have to behave well, because it's not the universe will not help you. So I went to Merida. They, can, I, can I summarize my conversation with the consul? I think it's funny. Can I? Yes. I go to Merida it's the United States consulate, and the consul says, wait a minute, uh, you're not even from here, right? No, I'm from Argentina. Oh, and who are you here with in Mexico? Oh, on my own. Oh, and uh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I work at the hotel doing activities. Oh, and what is your salary? A Mexican sombrero, perhaps. <laughs> oh, do you own a house either here or in back home in Argentina? No. Do you own a car or anything? No. Are you even married? No. Do you have children? Not that I know of. I <laughs> so he said, and, uh, do you have money? Do you have a bank account? And I was like, yeah, minus $3,000 <laughs> that I own to my mom and my dad. So he said, you are exactly the kind of person that he, we don't want to enter in the United States. <laughs> he would have like, thank you very much, I even agree with you. <laughs> so then I realized that, uh, so this is the US consulate in Merida, then I realized that not only women reject me, countries reject me too. This picture of me being rejected by women. Countries reject me too. They rejected my visa. I still have the passport with the visa rejected for the United States. This was in 2003. But far from leaving my dream of going to the United States and working there, when I finished my experience in Mexico, in Cancun, I went home and I started applying for uh, working experiences, like internships. I knew the payment wasn't going wasn't to be good, but the experience was good. It was going to be fun and, and very enjoyable for me. So I applied for a one-year working experience, internships, and I met this... Uh, Oh, so never, never give up on your dreams, because I really wanted to work in the United States. And my dreams in Mexico and Brazil were so good that I said, I'm going to do the next one to the United States. I didn't want to give up. So the American Hospitality Academy, they hired me with my experience in Cancun to be a supervisor for activities in different hotels in Merrill Beach, South Carolina. Do you know where that is? And six months in Orlando. Are you from there or you've been there, right? You know that Merrill Beach in South Carolina is the number one touristic local local touristic destination in the United States. Locally, not internationally, that's many others, such as Orlando, New York, or many others. But yeah, Myrtle Beach was very famous for the tourism. So I got sent there for six months. Uh, that's Myrtle Beach, it's very famous for golf. By the way, you know how short people like me, we call mini golf? <laughs> we call it golf. <laughs> so, um, oh, so we had a, an agreement with Habitat for Humanity. I'm sure you heard that company. So in our days of Saturday and Sunday, we would go and build and help building houses for those that didn't have. And it was a great experience. I built the house, then I found out two weeks later the house fell down. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but it was so great, the experience in the United States. I came a whole year, six months in Brazil Beach, six months in Orlando. I loved it. I was even giving Spanish lessons to the students. We would recruit students from different countries, place them in the different hotels, and I was in charge of teaching them how to do the activities in the different hotels. With my experience in Cancun, I was really good at it. Now I was also giving on my free time um, Spanish lessons. Speaking of languages, you know how you call a person that speaks multiple languages? Multilingual. You know how you call a person that speaks two languages? Bilingual. You know how you call a person that speaks only one language? An American. <laughs> you know how you call a person that speaks no languages whatsoever? Alejandro. Oh, what my salary was. So, you know, it was an internship. So my salary I knew from the beginning wasn't going to be good. It was a dollar per month. <laughs> you may love, but in my country with one dollar you can buy a house. With a dollar you can buy a neighboring country. <laughs> it depends on which country. Brazil would just go for free. <laughs> I'm only joking. But the salary obviously wasn't good. I was there for the experience. But hey, let me tell you this. At the age of 27, me and my best friend, his name is Fabio, he was coincidentally from Brazil. We were in Orlando. I did six months in Myrtle Beach, the last six months in Orlando. I met my good friend Fabio. And both of us, we didn't have money. Because obviously we were not getting very well paid there. I wasn't paid well in Mexico or Brazil, so I needed money. I was my, my bank account at the age of 27 was minus $3,000, and I'm not even joking. So imagine nowadays, this was a long time ago, but imagine nowadays if you have a kid that is 27 years old and has no money and owns $3,000 to other people. So, me and my friend, we were in the same situation. We were finishing our one year working experience in the United States. Our visas were expiring, so we were about to leave. We took a, a car and we drive from Orlando to Miami. And for the first time ever, we see the big cruise ships in the port of Miami. This is just a, a normal picture of many celebrity ships. But at the time, we saw an image that was very similar to this. We stopped the car. Parked the car there, we sat down at the bench, and him and I were like, wow, that would be awesome to work on a cruise ship, because we knew that it would give us a chance to continue to travel, which we wanted, but also save some money. So, because we knew kind of that in the cruise ships we wouldn't spend, because everything is uh, included. So, we were looking at this image, and my friend Fabio and I were like, oh, this would be amazing. So I went home, I applied for all companies, cruise lines, and the only one that uh, answered was NCL, you know, Norwegian Cruise Line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice company, I loved it. You know that cruise line that has a lot of families, 400, 500 kids running around every day, so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> they offered me, so I went to an interview, and they offered me the job as a pool attendant. Pool attendant in NCL is kind of like a step below the activity host. A pool attendant would be the one that would go on, because you know in NCL they have so many kids, so they have uh, more toys for the kids, such as the sliding, what's the name? The water, the water slide, and so on. So the pool attendant would be the person that goes on the top of the water slide, for instance, saying, hey, stop, okay, go kid, stop, okay, go, so that the kids don't smash each other in the water. So that's the job of the pool attendant. And I remember saying to the person that was on the phone with me, oh no, I'm looking for an activity host position because of my experience in Mexico and in the United States, I thought I could do activity host position. He said to me, sorry, we don't have that position for you. We only have pool attendant. Do you know of anyone that would want the position? My friend Fabio from Brazil was already home, and he was younger than me. So I called Fabio, so I knew Fabio wouldn't mind. Say, hey, Fabio, do you want to do NCL? They offer you to be pool attendant. He said, yeah, why not? So I got the job for Fabio. Now, guess what? Fabio, being a smart kid, he gets there two months later, he gets promoted to activity homes. <laughs> and he paid back the favor. And as soon as he got promoted to activity host, now he works right along with the cruise director in NCL. And he went to the cruise director and said, hey, we need to bring this Alejandro from Argentina. He's not smart, but he's so much fun. <laughs> and so only a few months later, we, Fabio and I, we were working together in the same cabin in the Norwegian Pearl. That was my first time on a cruise ship in 2007. Do um, you guys want to know how a, a, a cabin for an activity host looks like? This wasn't my, my cabin, but it's exactly how it looks like. So there's a very small room, you have bunk beds. The person, normally the person that is new, that joined the, the cabin the, the soonest, or just now, goes in the top bed, the, the older one goes in the lower bed, and so on. So this is a small space, um, but it was great. It was my first experience in NCL. I remember when I stepped into that ship, my first experience was getting into the theater, and I remember the cruise director at the time, was very boring, and every time he would speak at, at, at the end of the show, the people would just walk away. 
And I remember thinking, oh, when I become a cruise director, I'm going to make sure that nobody leaves when I speak, but here it is happening. <laughs> <laughs> this is how, after, oh, so after a few, after a year and a half in NCL, my cruise director comes to Celebrity. He really liked me, and he said, hey, why don't you come to Celebrity with me? and you can come as my assistant. That was a huge promotion for me. So I said, yes, of course. So I come to Celebrity as an activity manager, which is the, the assistant cruise director. And that's what the cabin looks like when you're an activity manager. The big privilege that comes with that position is that you no longer share a cabin. Mm -hmm. And that is great privilege. You know what other privilege comes with that one? That you can now invite family or friends. When you have a cabin for yourself, you can invite friends and family. When you share a cabin, you're not allowed to. So that's the moment that I started inviting my family. You remember the family that was always reminding me how black sheep I was? <laughs> now they all love me. <laughs> I started inviting the family, friends, mom, auntie, brother, dad, everybody. And, and then, after three years as activity manager, I was promoted to cruise director. This was 2011. And since then, I am loving every part of this, and I would not trade it for anything. I love it. Do you want to know what my cabin looks like? Yes. yes. As a cruise director? Yes. yes. <laughs> Does anybody want to cruise with me? <laughs> Oh, this is the first time that my mom came, the very first time that my mom came cruising with me. When I, when I was already promoted to cruise director, I was already on the TV and so on. Uh, and then so many relatives. These are my nieces and nephews. I've done so many South American seasons. We go to Buenos Aires. My family comes. They see the show. They see me on the stage. I bring them on the stage and so on. So much fun. This is my sister in uh, Nikonos. I don't want to bore you with this, but this is my sister in the Parthenon. You know the Parthenon? The Acropolis yes. in Athens? You know the Parthenon? There's a rumor going on, by the way, saying that the Parthenon was built by a group of constructor workers from Argentina. I don't know who's talking about this. This is my auntie who is right here with us, this cruise. This was 2016. This is my same auntie, 2010. I invite my family to cruise with me in Europe. It was so awesome. Ah, if you don't like my hair now, look at in the time and you see, you have to appreciate what you have now. <laughs> this is the same auntie. And if you don't like my mustard suit, look, it can always be worse. <laughs> I look like an astronaut. And nobody was telling me. My auntie kept telling me, hey, you look good. You look pretty. <laughs> this is my mom who's with us this cruise. And so on, so on, so on. I don't want to bother you. This is auntie and mom. And Okay, we always wanted to go, this is what I was just saying at the beginning of this presentation, we always wanted to come to, uh, to Jerusalem, we've always wanted to, but none of our family members could. And this presentation, I did it last cruise, and look how we can update it with, yes, this was two days ago. <laughs> That's auntie, mom, and me. Uh, this is my mom, my dad, my uncle, and so on. So all my family members have come cruise with me. No, wait, 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 wait. Uh, my family members came cruising with me so many times, I didn't even know I have so many relatives. <laughs> I was a stripper, and this may sound like a joke, but I was a stripper, but then I got fired. You want to know why I got fired? Because the ladies in the first row, they had to squint. <laughs> so I went to the manager, and I didn't even understand that explanation. So I said, why, why, why are you firing me? And he said, Alejandro, you, no big deal. <laughs> but let me tell you the, the, the honest truth. It was that when I came to NCL, the Norwegian Pearl, 2008, the, my friend Fabio was doing this together with the cruise director. I was the new guy, the activity host, the new guy. Now, I need to tell you, Fabio was a very good looking, super tall, uh, muscle, super good looking guy. And when I stepped into that ship, they were doing, you know the movie Chippendales? Yeah. They were doing the Chippendales. Yeah. The, the ship version of that movie, Chippendales. So they explained what it is. So it was in the middle of the, uh, obviously in the late hours, 11 p.m., adults only. We go to the nightclub and one by one, the, la the cruise director was the last one. We, they would be stripping, obviously not entirely, but it was a fun event and it was really very fun. They asked me to do it, I said no, but then the cruise director said that I have to, so I said okay. Yeah. Then my, my only thing is like, I want to go before Fabio. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it, it was so much fun. Look, 2007, <laughs> my signature movement was taking the belt off and hitting the, the so much fun. <laughs> we had the naked cruise on 2015, on board the Celebrity Constellation, it was a cruise, this is another fun anecdote and a fun memory. Um, it was a charter cruise where all the guests, we don't sell the cruise for anyone, it's just a company that uh, books the entire cruise, a seven day Caribbean run, 
and, and it's called Bare Necessities. Great people, I'm, I'm not even joking anymore. They charter the cruise and they tell the crew members in advance, hey, in whatever month, we're gonna have a charter cruise, the guests will be naked. It's called Bare Necessities. The, after the drill on the first day, the guests take off their clothes. Obviously the crew, we have to remain with clothes. So they come to the crew members in advance asking the crew, because they know that we come from 70 different nationalities and some cultures it's not okay to see other people that are naked. So they come to us in advance and say, hey, in a few months we're gonna have the naked charter crew, so if you don't feel comfortable with it, they will transfer you to another ship and so on. When they asked me, I was like, yeah, why not? Bring it on. <laughs> okay, so they brought their own cruise director. It was so much fun. And actually, I remember, I, I recognize a few of you from that cruise. <laughs> <laughs> And some people ask me if I have a girlfriend. I don't have a girlfriend, but if I had one, I wish I had one, or two. <laughs> if I had one, or a boyfriend at this point, I don't know. <laughs> if I had one, this is how I, I would propose, because I'm fun for the mountain. So if I ever go on a mountain with one of you, uh, be ready, I may have a ring for it. <laughs> now, I, I used to have this one girlfriend. This was the longest girlfriend I've ever had. It was a, a long relationship. It was three total months that I was with her. It was in 2011, the first Alaska, no, Antarctica cruise that I did on board Celebrity Infinity, South America. We go to Antarctica, look how beautiful the scenery is. She's from England, and we still are in touch. And 10 years later, like a year ago, I was so excited, I kept contact with her. Uh, I was so excited to go see her again. I go to England, and uh, but yeah, she is married, and she, she's got a tall husband and two kids, and I am not the tall husband. <laughs> <laughs> but she's lovely. Okay, so then, people ask me, hey, what's the most beautiful place you've ever been? Certainly, Bahia Paraiso, which is Paradise Bay in Antarctica. Has anyone been there, Antarctica? Yeah. Yes. Some, yeah, obviously, yes. Were. Did yes. you have good weather, like this? Yes. 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 The weather is like, whoa. Yes. And yeah, look at that. The Paradise Bay is like if you would count the peaks of the mountains, uh, all covered in snow, and you place them in the water. It's an unbelievable place, and I will encourage you to go visit it. If you ever have the time to come to South America, we'll take it to Antarctica. Uh, also, favorite cruise. I'll do this cruise for free. I don't tell anyone because they still pay me. But it's the Brazilian cruise. We go to Brazil during Carnival and we spend two overnights in Rio de Janeiro during Carnival. It's like Mardi Gras when you go to New Orleans. In Rio de Janeiro, Carnival is just crazy. I paraded in the Sambodrome two times. You buy the costume and then you can parade in the Sambodrome. So much fun. Two years, different years. It was so much fun. Let me talk about Argentina. Let me just uh, briefly bring in Argentina, which is my country to you. But I promise I'm not going to make it boring. Tango is very traditional from Argentina. Now, if you talk about Brazil, because I'm a big fan of Brazil, after having worked in Brazil, I love Brazil. Argentina and Brazil were kind of like rivals, but only in football and soccer, because they don't like us, because they, they know we are better. That's <laughs> Not really. But I believe that the two characteristic dances from each country can summarize how the people are. Tango is very serious. Tango is very difficult to dance, and always with a straight face. The lyrics of tango are always serious, melancholic. The love that couldn't be, the world that is not the best place. The colors of tango are only black, red, I don't know about the green there, I think it's an image here from it. But um, it's only three colors, white, black, or red. Now, samba, which is a traditional dance of Brazil, is exactly the opposite. It's all the colors in the world. You cannot dance samba unless you're smiling. The lyrics of samba are always happy, party, carnival, love, and so on. So I believe that those two um, dances, they actually paint how the people are. It's like, you know how in my family I said, my brother and sister are the smart ones, I'm the fun one. Well, Argentinians, we are the smart ones, Brazilians are fun ones. <laughs> and, and you can tell that I like samba more than tango. <laughs> I'm the one sitting in the steps. We brought samba dancers to the South American cruise on the Celebrity Eclipse. Oh, let me tell you, some people say, hey, what was the funniest complaint you've ever had? I promise you this is gonna sound like a joke. I promise, no joke, this is a true story. We were sailing in South America, we were just visiting Puerto Madryn, which is the city in Argentina that has the largest reserve of penguins in the world. So many penguins. We, in our, in our short excursions, we, one of our organized short excursions on board, we take the guests to see the penguins. This gentleman, came back from the tour, went straight to guest relations to complain, 
Too many penguins in the penguin book. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. The Kiss Relations team thought this was so much funny that they actually printed this. This is many years ago. They printed this complaint and they stapled it and they put it in the back of the office. You people complain about him. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, working on a cruise ship. I just want to bring to your attention. Working on a cruise ship is such a great experience. If anyone of you, or if you know of anyone that would want to work on a cruise ship, and it's the best advice I can give you. Do it. Get someone to come work on a cruise ship. It's a wonderful experience. It opens up your mind so much. Here you work on an environment surrounded by people from 70 different countries, cultures, languages, people that are so completely different from you. And then you, after working on a cruise ship, you get to understand how we're not really that different. And so if you know of anyone that wants to work on a cruise ship, so the brain opens up. I even changed my political views after working so many years on a cruise ship. Because I really, again, like I said, I realize we're not so different. So, oh, after working on a cruise ship, everyone wants to have you. Because working on a cruise ship, everyone knows that here, in, in, regardless of the company that you work for, if it is a cruise ship, we all strive for excellence. And they know that on a cruise ship, a crew member will always really try for excellence and go out of the ways to help the guests in whatever they need. And we're on 24 seven. So after working on a cruise ship, you, you, your resume, it's a good one. So if you know anyone that would want to work on a cruise ship, direct them to me and I will uh, help them. Not necessarily become a celebrity, but I will help them. For them to have one uh, working experience on a cruise ship, it's just a wonderful experience, I promise. Um, oh, after so many years working on a cruise ship, my resume is so good, now I think I could be a president. <laughs> Especially of the United States. <laughs> Judging by the last two you have. I just wanted to piss off everybody equally. I'm only joking. Let me present to you my country very briefly. I'm not going to make it boring. I'm going to make it fun. I hope you learn something about my little country. It's called Argentina. It's in the very south of the world. The very, very south in the southern hemisphere. The south of the southern hemisphere. You know, there are two hemispheres. The north and the south hemisphere where the good looking people come from. <laughs> Um, so we have a big diversity of landscapes, weather and so on. The south is pleasing because the southern you go, the colder it gets because because you're getting further away from the equator. And of course the opposite, the northern you go, the warmer it gets because you're getting closer to the equator. So we've got very diverse uh, climates, weather and uh, landscapes. This is the flag, the one with the sun in the middle is the one that is from Argentina. Halloween, in Argentina we don't believe in Halloween, you want to know why? Because in cities, so scary. The cities like my cities, uh, where everything is so scary, Halloween would be redundant. It <laughs> 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 was a joke. <laughs> we don't believe in Santa Claus because who's going to convince an Argentinian that a stranger is going to come to our neighborhoods in the dark, in the middle of the night, into our houses to deliver presents? <laughs> Economy is not good. It's so not good that I was a teenager. I was in 16, 17. One night I went out uh, with my friends to the nightclub. I didn't make it home until 11 a.m. the following morning. My parents have already rented my room. <laughs> you know why the population never grows in my country? Because every time a, f a, a baby is born, a father runs away. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> Couchos, I'm only joking. I, I, on the opposite, I'm trying to encourage you to visit my country. Very beautiful country, We're very well prepared for tourism. You're going to be very surprised with how awesome Argentina is, so please come. And I will be there to help you if you actually do come for our, to Argentina. So if you know anyone that wants to work on a cruise ship, or that wants to know about it, or anyone that goes to Argentina, or even Brazil, where I have worked and I love, tell them to contact me in social media. Cruz, Director Alejandro. Those three words I hope you can remember. In Instagram or in Facebook. Cruz, Director Alejandro. I don't need any comments. But if you have any questions, I will be happy to tell you where to go, where not to go, what to do, what not to do, and so on. I will help you expecting nothing in exchange. I promise you, I'll give you my word. You can find me on Instagram or Facebook, Cruz Director Alejandro. Okay, so Cauchos, if you come to Buenos Aires, the Cauchos are not going to be in the city, but they're going to be in the interior of the country. The Cauchos are our version of the cowboys that you guys have in the US. Of course, the Cauchos. 10 times better looking. And if they would ever play a football game, the Cauchos would beat the Cowboys. The Cowboys always lose anyway. <laughs> tango. We're very famous for Tango. This is a very famous movie. Have you seen this movie, Scent of a Woman? Yeah. We're dancing to an Argentinian song. It's an awesome movie, but also a great song. We're very proud of Tango. If you ever go to Buenos Aires, make sure you go watch a Tango show. There are so many, and promises to never disappoint to go watch a Tango show. 
Um, what else do I want to tell you about my country? Wine. Uh, we are so proud of the wine that we produce. Look how funny it is that we in Argentina, we are the fifth largest producer of wine in the world. And historically, we consume 90% of what we produce. <laughs> Going from the very beginning, we're not just pretty, we're also very smart. <laughs> Messi, he's the best footballer, the football in soccer. He's great, he's been known around the world. Anyone knows him or am I speaking to nobody here? You know who he is? Okay, he's a superstar, we love him. And he, it's funny because he, he is a big fan of me. He wants to look like me and he always dresses the same way I do. Now, one of his pictures is messy, the other picture is me. I cannot tell you which one is which and I know you cannot tell him. He wants to look like me. Ah, women, in Argentina, women are very beautiful. Let me explain why, but because I, I put this picture because my girlfriend is there, my actual girlfriend is there. Do you, can I point her, can I point my girlfriend? Is this one here. Not the blonde girl, but the soccer ball, the soccer ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's my girlfriend, I've been always loyal to that girlfriend, the soccer ball. Uh, men are also very beautiful, look at that hair. Let me tell you about Evita. Have you heard of Eva Peron? Evita, she's never been the president. She was the longest, so, she was the wife of the longest serving president. His name was Juan Perón, and that's why she's known around the world by Eva Perón. Her name was Eva, she married the president, and she became the first lady. Now, there's a lot of controversy in my country around her figure. If you ask 100 Argentinians, even in my own family, half of them will tell you horrible things about her, and the other half will tell you the most nicest things about her. So there's a lot of controversy, and we obviously don't want to get political on this, but I can tell you that the one thing that we should all agree, kind of, is that most of those that had less really liked her. So she wanted to be remembered as a woman who brought the hopes and dreams of the people to the president. She was very good with public speaking. She was super powerful. She would convince people to do things and so on. And she would be very, very uh, dear to so many millions of Argentinians. And one thing that we can always say about her, this is a sad picture because she died uh, at, uh, on her early 30s because of cancer. This is a sad picture. She uh, um, addressing the people in the balcony of the pink house, which is our version of the White House. And the president is holding her because she was so weak she couldn't even hold herself. So it's a sad picture. The one thing we could say that is obviously very positive about her is that she fought hard and very efficiently for the women in my country to finally get the right to vote. Because in the old days, when she was there, the women didn't vote. She fought so hard that she eventually got it done. And uh, a little bit after she died, the women got the right to vote. So that was a great thing that we cannot deny, right? So Eva Perón, very famous. Diego Maradona, anyone here from England? Yeah. My favorite part of the presentation. So, <laughs> Diego Maradona is a football player. I know you don't care much for football because you, you're from countries that you're not good at football, such as England, <laughs> US, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> but he was so good. He won the World Cup in 1986. He played on his own. The other 10, in football, he played with 11 players. He was the only one that was good. The other 10 people were like me getting 10 of you, and let's go win the World Cup. <laughs> this picture shows how good one Argentinian is comparing to six people from other countries. <laughs> you want to know what those, what that, that country is, the ones in red? Brazil. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's Belgium. Belgium. Um, this is the hand of God. This is very famous because Argentina in the quarterfinals of the World Cup in 1986, we, we, yes, we played England in the quarterfinal. And um, it was the first time that Argentina plays England in the World Cup after the Falklands War. That was a big, big, obviously we don't want to get into that, but the English, they won the war, Argentina lost the war, so this was the first time they, they meet in the, in the World Cup. So it was the chance for Argentina to beat England at something. And so he scored a goal with a hand, it was an obvious hand, in football you cannot do that. But everyone saw the hand. My father was in the stadium, even from the stadium he saw the hand. Everybody saw the hand, except for the referee. <laughs> I can tell you, the referee was my grandfather! <laughs> This is the Pope. Did you know that the Pope of the Catholic Church is from Argentina? The yes. first yes. ever yes. Latin American Pope. Normally, we've never, well, never ever we've had a Latin American Pope. So we're very proud of him. You know how I said that Eva Perón, very controversial. The Pope certainly is not. I understand it's not easy to be the Pope of the Catholic Church, and many of you may not like him for whatever reason, but we in Argentina, we really do like him a lot. He used to be a Jesuit and he became the head of the Buenos Aires Catholic Church, and then he became the head of the Argentina Catholic Church, and elected Pope a few years ago. He's still there, we're very proud of him. 
Maxima, the Queen of Holland. Anyone here from Holland? You're from Holland. Don't let me lie. Maxima, the Queen of Holland is from Argentina. She was a young lady who visited, who one day she flew to Holland. She stayed there. She met the prince. They fell in love. The prince became the king and she became the queen. In other words, uh, Argentina rules Holland. <laughs> she really is the queen of Holland. Her name is Maxima. She's very famous there. Right? I was joking with the ruling of you. We don't rule you. We wish we did. Ma uh, what's the name of this guy? Michael Bublé. You know where he's from? Canada. Yeah. Whatever. He's married to an Argentinian. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful, this model. Um, Matt Damon. He's married to an Argentinian. Eric Clapton. Married to an Argentinian. And then you ask me why I have no girlfriend. You people keep stealing the girls. So <laughs> Even this guy. And I'm sure you... Anyone from North Carolina? He used to be the governor of North Carolina. He, he said, I'm going on a business trip, and he met with this Argentinian young lady, yeah. very, very famous at the time. I guess I'm not going to bring this picture anymore because nobody recognizes him. <laughs> I was told, just put that picture, everybody would recognize it. Anybody here has a clue who he is? Yes. Yeah. Only two people. <laughs> because I just explained who he is. <laughs> Uh, obelisk, this is what I said, the, the, the symbol of the city is the obelisk, who is a, which is a replica of the one that you guys have in Washington. There is a rumor going on saying that the one in Washington is a replica from this one in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Rio de Janeiro, why do I bring this up? Because I'm trying to encourage you guys. You guys, nor, most of you are from the Northern Hemisphere. You're so far away from us back in the south of the world in Argentina. So if you ever come down to south of South America, I will encourage you not only to go to Buenos Aires, but also make sure you spend some days in Rio de Janeiro, which is an unbelievable city. This is what the city looks like. You can even go up that mountain. That's the statue of Christ in the top of the mountain. It's called Corcovado. And it's an awesome city for you to go. If anyone wants to go to Rio, you can write me. I'll tell you where to go, where not to go, what to do, and so on. Uh, in the old days, Rio de Janeiro was having problems with, with the insecurity. But now that has been improved much better. But you just need to know where or with who you go. So, if you are from the Northern Hemisphere, come down to Buenos Aires, go to Rio de Janeiro, and in between these two cities is my favorite place that I believe is the most beautiful place in Argentina. And it is the Iguazu Waterfalls. Has anyone been there? Yeah! Do you like it? Yes. Equally distant, because the Iguazu Falls are in the border between Argentina and Brazil. In the, again, equally distant from Rio and from Buenos Aires. So, if you go to Buenos Aires, Make sure you go to the falls. From the falls, you go to Rio de Janeiro, and you did what's best in South America, in my humble opinion. These are images of the Iwasu waterfall. It's a, it's a semicircle of one mile of water falling. It's huge. Has anyone been to the Niagara Falls? Yes. Yeah. Me too, I wonder. I couldn't find the, the falls. They're so small. I couldn't find them. <laughs> so, but this is just so big. It's unbelievable. Now, let me tell you that the Iguazu River divides one country from another one. Up there is Argentina, down here is Brazil, and you can tell because the vegetation up there is prettier than down here. <laughs> the river divides the falls. Now, how funny it is that 90% of the falls are on the Argentinian side. The Brazilians, they make fun of us because, because the fact that they are, most of the falls are on the Argentine, this is all Argentina, but because the falls are on our side, most of them, all that is Argentina. All he, only here is Brazil. The Brazilians make fun because they say, because <laughs> you can see the falls better from their side because the falls are all on our side. So the Brazilians say, <laughs> you put on the show, we get the tickets. <laughs> <laughs> this movie, very famous movie, has anyone seen it? The Mission. Yes. With a few super awesome actors. Liam Neeson when he was young. Um, what's the name? Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons. It's a great movie. It talks about the Jesuits. This was in the old days. Now it's between Argentina and Brazil. But mm. that territory where the falls are, the mission was filmed in this territory. You can see the waterfalls in the movie. So in the old days, it was the Spanish, uh, the Spaniards fighting against the Portuguese, trying to conquer the lands. And in the middle of their fight, the Indians were there. So the Jesuits were sent to try to help the Indians to get them a little bit more organized. The movie is awesome. I encourage you to watch this movie. And again, it was filmed in the waterfalls. We like the movie back home. Look how the sceneries of the Argentina, like I said, very different landscapes, places that are so different from the south to the west, to the mountains in the north, and so on. Uh, look, these are two pictures. One of these pictures is Bryce Canyon, and the other one is in Argentina. 
One of these pictures is Bryce Canyon, the other one is Argentina. You wanna guess which one is which? This is Argentina, this is Bryce Canyon in Utah. Look how similar the territories are. You know how I could tell? This is the United States, you guys have three, three rocks, but they're falling apart. We have one very good for made it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of me when I was 17 in the northwest of Argentina. I am the only human that with age looks better. Yes. <laughs> Uh, these are the mountains here. We have the Andes Mountains that divide Argentina from Chile. The Andes Mountains is actually the same chain of mountains that gets different names along the way, from the very south of, of America all the way to the north of North America. You guys call it, for instance, the Rocky Mountains, but it's the same chain of mountains that gets different names along the way. We call them the Andes Mountains, and that point there is the Aconcagua Mountain. It's the highest mountain in the world, aside of the Himalayas. So if we would remove the Himalayas, which is a system of mountains where, for instance, the Everest is, if, uh, if we set aside the Himalayas, we've got the tallest mountain in the world. It's my dream to go up there. It's called Aconcagua. It's almost 8,000 meters, which in feet is like a million. And I promise you I'm going to make it there. Every summer I go a little higher and higher. And I promise you I'm going to make it to the top. And if you don't see me again in another cruise ship, it's because I have remained at the top. <laughs> That's me, the different summer uh, travels that I've done up there to the mountain. Uh, okay, so if you, in summary, if you go to Buenos Aires, again, contact me. If you have anyone that would want to know anything about it, I will try to encourage you to come to Argentina. You'll have a great time. If you come to Buenos Aires, not just stay one day and then the next day go to the ship if you're taking a cruise. Make sure you spend some days in Buenos Aires. Go watch a gaucho show into an estancia. An estancia would be a place in the middle of the countryside, an hour, an hour and a half away from Buenos Aires, and you can watch a gaucho show. You see the gauchos in action, and they dance for you, and we have barbecue ready for you. So this is what we call an estancia. I encourage you to do that. Whatever hotel you stay at, you can ask, hey, what's a good estancia? They'll take you. And the next thing, obviously, go watch a tango show in the night of Buenos Aires. Make sure that you do so. It's a great experience. And, well, just wanted to mention that the World Cup, for all my British friends there in the World Cup, even Canada is in the World Cup. <laughs> Although they're not going to be there for a long time. <laughs> the World Cup is in November and December, so uh, Argentina may win it, maybe not. But if we do, you'll hear me scream from wherever ship you're on. <laughs> and I hope you learned something new about my country. I hope I didn't speak too much. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Any questions?